Wow, okay, so I'm a little late to the gumshoe party, but in a nutshell, it's a game system created by Robin D. Laws back in 2007 that aims to speed up and streamline clue finding and investigation in RPGs. Instead of rolling to see if PCs find a clue, they just have certain abilities that guarantee that a clue is found and it keeps mystery type scenarios moving forward. This system was published as a standalone book by Pelgrain Press, which has since then published a ton of specifically themed RPGs that use the gumshoe system. One of those games, Knight's Black Agents, was published in 2021 and was written by Kenneth Height. This is a game that pits your players, who are world-class spies and intelligence agents, against a global conspiracy run by vampires. And I gotta tell you, it is one of the most well put together and conceived RPGs I've ever encountered. The aim of Knight's Black Agents is to create a spy thriller horror adventure. There isn't quite a single media touchstone to compare this to, although the author has consumed a lot of media in the form of novels, TV shows, and movies across the spy thriller and vampire genres. Probably the closest I could describe it would be Born Identity or even James Bond versus vampires. But instead of a single heroic agent or spy, it's a small team of them. So maybe Mission Impossible with vampires. Any way you put it, this game calls itself a vampire spy thriller, and it mixes investigation scenes with action scenes. But there are actually four ways to approach it. Those four ways are basically different flavors of spy stories. Because in this game, you never play as a vampire. They're the bad guys. The players are always the spies. So the story modes are through that lens. You have burn mode, in which psychological damage on the agents is more pronounced and focused on. Then there's dust mode, which focuses on a more cinematic thriller tone. In this mode, you have some options to depower your agents and make the vampires much more powerful and menacing. Then there's mirror mode, where the emphasis is on the world being a quote, wilderness of mirrors, hidden agendas and shifting allegiances everywhere you look. And finally, there is the stakes mode, where the stakes at play are far higher than interpersonal alliances and things connected to the agents. The fate of the world is at stake here, generally. You can mix and match these modes, obviously, but all throughout the book, there are these little icons that indicate where a rule, tweak, or suggestion would further facilitate one game mode or another. Making a character with the gumshoe system is a relatively simple task. I won't get too into the nitty gritty, but basically you have a point buy system where you buy up to two kinds of abilities. There are investigative abilities, which you apply in scenes where you're gathering clues, and then general abilities, which are used in combat, confrontation, and action scenes. The max on any of these abilities is only three, but keep in mind, if you have even one point in an ability, that means you're a masterclass expert in that ability. If you have two points, you're maybe even famous for that ability. And with three points, you're basically second to none. The idea here is that your agents are professional spies or by default, former spies who have been wrangled into a sort of freelance investigation team outside of government scrutiny. You're the best of the best. Anyway, next step is to buy your general abilities, which are supposed to cover all of the spy thriller type action you'd see in the game. You'll notice that there are more investigative abilities than there are general ones. And that's because this is a gumshoe game where gathering clues is a foundational part of gameplay. Your MOS or military occupational specialty is a skill or activity that you can succeed at once per session, guaranteed. It's basically a story and game device that empowers players to make the game more like a movie or a novel than anything. Although one important caveat is that the MOS can never automatically defeat a supernatural challenge directly. One way to quickly choose from all of these abilities is just to choose a so-called background, which are prepackaged sets of abilities wrapped in a character theme. You can see the list of backgrounds here on the top right. You'll notice the names borrow heavily from spy thriller novels. One fun sidebar here throws a few bonus backgrounds at you, including one for basically Jason Bourne, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and James Bond, in case you wanted to go in those directions. The book breaks down the abilities with a bunch of examples for each. I did find personally that this list of abilities seems a little too spread out and it felt like some were redundant. One thing I started to notice this far into the book is that there was hardly anything distinguishing this game from a normal spy thriller investigation RPG completely devoid of vampires. It was when I saw this vampirology ability that I was reminded that there are vampires in this game. And spoiler alert, 
Not only can this game be run without vampires at all, it's actually one of the three suggested game modes mentioned at the end of the book, which is to say, Nice Black Agents is two games in one, spies versus global conspiracy or spies versus global vampire conspiracy, which are two pretty different games if you think about it. Anyway, the book goes on to unpack all the general abilities as well. And one thing it adds on top of vanilla gumshoe mechanics is something called cherries. My guess is that the name is referring to cherries on top. I'm not sure, but a player gets a cherry ability when they have eight or more points dumped into a single general ability. This is a sort of over the top feat related to the ability itself. You had eight or more points in infiltration, you could automatically pick or bypass most door locks and alarms without having to roll a test. I found preparedness to be a special one because it allows the player to retroactively add gear to their possessions as if they had it all along. It's like a flashback move where they can conjure up any kind of equipment they need in the moment. The cherry for this ability allows the players to basically conjure up an entire cache of equipment by suddenly remembering it. There's a whole point economy to each character's mental stability and they have sources of stability which can be attacked and destroyed. There are fairly specific rules for what happens when your sources of stability like a trinket or a person you trust or safe house are destroyed but basically it harms your ability to refresh stability points. Your character's drive is their motivating factor for carrying on with an investigation or whatever the storyline entails. And it's pretty important that the players use it as a reason to keep throwing their agents into danger. The book lists 12 possible drives and you'll notice those little icons scattered throughout. I was actually pretty impressed with how consistently the author calls up these four narrative modes throughout the book. I really got the sense that there are four distinct ways to play out a story, not just with different flavors and nuance, but with tons of little optional changes and tweaks to the actual mechanics of the game. Okay, so the big gimmick or thrust of the gumshoe system is that when players try to find clues, they pretty much get them. There are some exceptions to this, but actually the GM or director in this case is supposed to orchestrate a scene so that it's never a question of whether or not agents find the clues, but rather how to interpret them. So for example, if an agent enters a room and there are strange bloody hieroglyphs scratched onto the walls, they just say that they have the vampirology ability and the director explains to them the clue. There's no role or any barrier to that information. Passive clues are given to players outright, whereas active clues are ones where players have to jump this relatively low hurdle. Each of your abilities has its own spendable point pool and you can spend those points when an ability is in play in order to embellish its effect to basically buy a benefit that comes in the form of flavor or narrative flourish. These are called spends, and players need to ration out how often they make spends throughout a session since these points don't refresh super fast. There are some examples in the bottom left here on what a spend might look like. General abilities apply to what are simply called tests, and those always involve rolling a single D6. That's right, this game uses exactly one D6 per player. The idea on a roll is to meet or go over a difficulty number, usually four. Since you can spend points from your ability pool to add to a die roll in tests, your total can exceed six, which of course means that sometimes the difficulty target you're trying to beat is six, seven, or in the most extreme circumstances, eight or nine. One interesting note is that if you don't have a, any rating in a general ability, you can't make a test in it. There are some alternatives to this rule, but generally speaking, the game wants you to build characters that have a wide, shallow pool of abilities. And by extension, it wants you to have a team of characters whose composite collection of abilities covers as much ground as possible. That way clues will never be missed and more tests can be made when needed. I'm doing kind of a disservice here by glossing over most of the chase mechanics in this game because they really are some of the best I've ever seen, but I'm just gonna hit the highlights. Basically, you're asked to throw in a chase scene only once in a while and have it kind of planned out in terms of the environment and the obstacles. There are two components to a chase scene, the runner and the pursuer, and there is one point pool called the lead. The lead starts at five and the parties take turns rolling ability checks to either whittle the lead down to zero, at which point the pursuer catches the runner, or build the lead up to 10 points, at which point they'd get away. Like I said, I won't belabor the mechanics here, but 
I thought they were well described in the book and pretty straightforward in terms of the possible outcomes. You also get a list of descriptions for different environments like a European tourist city or a Middle Eastern bazaar. By the way, you might have noticed that this book leans heavily towards pretty European locations and factions, but that's purely a reflection of the author's taste. Your game could take place obviously anywhere in the world, most likely in urban environments though. Just to kind of highlight how thorough chases are described, there are rules for parkour, ramming vehicles, sudden escapes, swerving, giving someone else the wheel, and three-party chases, in which case you just run two separate lead pools between the three parties. With combat in this game, each character takes a turn at rolling abilities, trying to meet or beat the opponent's hit threshold. Their hit threshold is the difficulty number in this case. If there's a hit, the attacker then rolls the d6 again and adds or subtracts a damage modifier depending on their weapon. The resulting damage is then reduced by armor, if any, and the rest goes against the opponent's health pool. When a character reaches zero, they collapse. Gumshoe games have a pretty wild health track by default. Health can actually go well below zero. Anywhere between zero and negative five, and you're considered hurt, and that comes with its own mechanics. Then between negative six and negative 11, you're seriously wounded. It's not until you hit negative 12 or lower that your character dies. There are a few pages that provide more detailed combat mechanics in case you wanted to shore up that aspect of the game for yourself. And my favorite part of any self-respecting RPG, the stat block for the dog. I really appreciated how much love was put into this dog stat block. You can see that it is over twice the length of the other stat blocks in this generic NPC section. The extended combat mechanics actually go on for some time. Extra attacks, feints, jumping in the middle of a fight, martial arts rules, and so on and so forth. Pretty much to the point that if you can think of an edge case in combat, there's a rule for it here. As I mentioned earlier, agents have to contend with loss of stability points, which represent their mental health. There's a handy table over on the right here that provides examples of different sources of stability loss, ranging from one point to eight points of loss in a single incident. Your stability points are structured pretty much like your health. At zero to negative five, you're shaken, negative six to negative 11, and you're shattered. And at negative 12 or lower, your character is retired due to incurable insanity. Mental conditions ranging from PTSD to addiction, obsession, and paranoia can plague your agent and further affect their stability point pool. There's also amnesia, borderline personality disorder, depression, multiple personality, and schizophrenia. Heat is a track that the whole team shares, and it simulates how much unwanted attention the team has gained from the authorities. Once per session, one player rolls against the current heat level. If they beat the roll, they don't pick up additional heat. If they fail the roll, then the authorities will interfere with the team at some point in the session. One thing I wanted to mention was how leveling up works. At the end of each operation, which can span multiple game sessions, players each get two experience points per session. They can spend these points as build points to either buy new abilities or level up existing ones. They can also reassign one or two build points from one ability to another. The sheer amount of advice on how to run a spy thriller game in this book is pretty staggering. The author complains at the end of the book that he couldn't find a single field manual or guide on how intelligence operatives work when he was researching this book. And look, I wouldn't say that this book is that guide that can be used in real life, but the breadth and scope of how spies work is about as good as you're gonna get in an RPG. Again, this game is fleshed out enough that you could run it completely as a spy thriller without the supernatural element. But here you really start to see where vampires fit into the game with mechanics on UV lamps, silver weapons, and holy water. I'm just gonna blast past all this stuff in the book, but there, it's worth noting that there's a sort of meta currency that the director uses called tactical fact-finding benefits or TFFBs. A TFFB is an opportunity that an agent creates by applying their abilities to the task of finding clues. TFFBs translates into three or four points to each agent that can be spent on refreshing ability point pools or reducing enemy target difficulties. Another loaded acronym, Tag Team Tactical Benefits, or TTTBs, are gained when two agents spend points together towards a single task, combining any number of ability pairings to pull off something special. I think one of my favorite aspects of this game is that the vampires are not defined specifically. There's no canon vampire. Instead, the author gives you a vampire workshop in which you can craft your own lore. So from the top, you have four basic types. 
supernatural, damned, alien, and mutant. These sort of describe the basis of the vampirism in your game, and of course, you can blend any of these however you wish. Notice here there are four special icons representing each of these basic archetypes. This whole chapter refers to these four types, so you'll see these icons a lot here. Once you've made that choice, you just need to unpack it a bit and answer some fundamentals. What is the exact origin of the vampirism? How does it spread? How many are there in the world? How many different kinds of vampires are there? How do they organize themselves? What keeps them alive? What kills them? What's their connection to humanity and humans? Is there a cure? Once you've got those questions sorted, you have to decide on which supernatural powers they have. One notable text box here discusses how you're really not supposed to play as a vampire in this game. But if a player absolutely insists on it, it's best to handicap them with vampire weaknesses, unwanted attention from other vampires, addiction of one sort or another, and costly abilities. Anyway, as far as choosing your vampiric powers, the book discusses preternatural awareness, health drain, visual illusions, vampiric infection, invisibility. The thing about all these powers is that any one of them can change the experience in your game. For example, if all your vampires had even just the one power of invisibility, the whole campaign could have vampires haunting the agents in person and them not realizing it until later on. Oh, here's another fascinating discussion in the red box here. Basically, if the vampires in your world don't have reflections in a mirror or don't show up in a camera photo or anything like that, then that becomes an extremely reliable test for agents to detect whether or not someone is a vampire. Just food for thought. Vampiric weaknesses are equally fascinating, if only because of the breadth of research on display here. You pretty much get all the cliche banes for a vampire listed here, as well as so-called blocks, which are things that prevent the passage of a vampire. They may also suffer from compulsions, which are things they really want to do but don't need to do in order to survive. Dreads are things that they hate or fear instinctively. And requirements are things that they have to do in order to survive. Like I said, it's a full vampire laboratory for you to create your own lore from, but there are also several pages of well-described sample vampires, one for each of the four basic vampire archetypes described at the beginning of the chapter. To mix things up a bit, the author also includes about a dozen vampire-related monsters. The Adze is a vampiric insect or worm that can infect a person's brain. The Buta is a ghost, basically. The Kamazots is a huge man-bat creature, basically a human body with a bat's head and wings. They like to rip people's heads off. The Dampir, Albanian for teeth drinker, is a hybrid vampire human who often has some of the powers of a vampire without their banes, blocks, or dreads. The Lamia is a female vampire with one serpentine feature or another. They are seductresses and cold-blooded killers. It's mentioned that Lamia fit right into a supernatural spy thriller because they can act as honeypots and seductive assassins. So in the big scheme of things, players in this game are trying to unravel a massive and far-reaching conspiracy. But in order to make that happen, the director has to understand a little bit about how conspiracies work, at least in this fictional spy thriller context. To maybe simplify things a bit, the author devised what he calls a conspiracy pyramid or conspiramid, composed of six levels. The conspiramid you see on the left here is filled with example cells, but the general structure is the same. At the bottom, you have street level NPCs and firms. Level two is at city level in terms of reach and influence. Level three is provincial or state level. Four contains actors at the national level. Five contains supranational powers. And at the top are the vampires. It could be one vampire, a council of vampires, or a society of hundreds or thousands of vampires. It's up to you. But the smaller and tighter the scope of the conspiracy, the simpler and faster your campaign will run. Another mainstay in this game, which I mentioned earlier, is that it's going to take place in cities for the most part. So with that in mind, the book gives you some tips on how to develop a city for the purposes of agent investigations and action scenes. It also touches on a smattering of intelligence agencies across the globe. I was hoping to see more US intelligence agencies unpacked here a bit more, considering, considering there are 16 of them employing hundreds of thousands of people. But this section of the book is just meant to point you in the right direction so you can do your own research. The author provides a sample city workup in the form of Marseille in Southern France. Honestly, I found it to be kind of a lot of information, but it did occur to me while reading this that if you really wanted to immerse your players in a spy thriller where they feel like they're investigating things and digging down, 
you really do have to have a wide breadth of knowledge or pseudo knowledge about the relevant history, culture, and maybe even geography of any given area. Whereas in previous chapters, there are explanations of spycraft, conspiracies, and city environments, here there is a detailed explanation of how to structure the experience itself. The game is composed of two parts, the mystery and the thriller. There's a pattern in play, and it's basically throw your players into an investigation scene, follow it up quickly with an action or danger scene, then investigation, then danger, then maybe some rest, then more investigation, then danger, and so on. The original Born Identity movie is cited here as a model for pacing. This chapter does go on to discuss other things like how not to railroad players, or at least make it feel like they're not being railroaded, and how to always say yes to players' cool ideas. And finally, it lands on a plot structure schema called the spine. The spine is the investigative line that agents will take as they pursue so-called core clues until they finally reach some kind of resolution. Surrounding the spines are individual scenes, and those are the skeleton. This whole spine skeleton metaphor, which I find a bit rough to be honest, is actually clearly illustrated in this bulleted list of general events here on the left. There's one other pyramid in this book, the Vampire Pyramid or Vam Pyramid, and it's a quote, dramatic response algorithm for the vampires. The boxes on this one are filled with examples, but the general structure for any Vam Pyramid from the bottom up goes reflex, containment, deflection, embrace, entrapment, and destruction. The idea here is that anytime your agents reach a certain level of the conspiracy, it triggers a response in the form of either an event or a fight with a monster or something like that. And as they work their way up this matrix, the difficulty numbers go up as well. This is a pretty neat way of mapping out the major encounters and story beats that you'd wanna see in a campaign. But I do think you need to be prepared to change and amend it over the course of your game if players accidentally come up with something cooler than what you thought of. As I mentioned before, this game can actually be played without vampires at all. There are some rules tweaks that you should make if you want to do that. You can also play this game in the style of Trail of Cthulhu, which is another gumshoe based game. Basically, it's Call of Cthulhu, but using the gumshoe system. And finally, there are some rule tweaks for playing the game where the agents also have paranormal powers. On the top right here, you can see a list of the possible powers sorted by other gumshoe based games, such as Ash and Stars, Fear Itself, Mutant City Blues, and again, Trail of Cthulhu. The next nine pages contain a sample scenario that surprisingly, as long as it is all written out here, doesn't cover too much in terms of what happens in the story. I feel like there was probably a way to present this scenario in fewer pages, but at least by reading through this, you get a sense of the scope of information the director is expected to handle. I really appreciated the sources section at the end of the book, where the author dumps onto you what he thinks are the most relevant media touchstones for this game. It seems like he's read and watched several lifetimes worth of spy thrillers and vampire movies, and so you get a pretty great list to track down and experience for yourself. All right, here are my thoughts on Knight's Black Agents. Extensive investigative abilities list. I felt like the list of investigation abilities could have probably been consolidated and simplified just a bit. Skills like reassurance and cop talk seemed a little too narrowly applicable to me. And with a more streamlined list, you can end up with a game that's easier to pick up and also reduce the chance of ever missing a clue by not having the right ability for the scene. But that does remind me, regarding the possibility of missing a clue because no one has the right investigative ability, there's actually a sheet at the end of the book for directors to use to write down every player's abilities. That way, a director can create clues that will guaranteed correspond to at least one person's set of abilities and just bypass any possibility of an impasse. Dead simple. I do appreciate how the author tried to beef up the gumshoe system with all the extra combat rules and stuff, but in the end, if you don't feel like it, you could easily skip all the extra stuff and play the core underlying game, which is a gumshoe game. There's really very little to track as a player, and that's a great thing if you're trying to get new or inexperienced players to jump right into a game. Researched spy game. This game is so easily converted into a straight up spy thriller without any vampires, and that's one of the game modes. And there's so many pages that support the director in making that spy thriller experience satisfying for players. The chase mechanics for one, and all the attention put into explaining and structuring a global conspiracy. That's where the rubber hits the road on a game with this theme. 
and the book delivers on all those fronts. Make your own vampire. The self-serve vampire creation is one of the most fun parts of this book. You're not getting anything particularly novel or groundbreaking in terms of vampire features to work with, but everything you do get is cleanly presented and well-organized. Neat layout. It can actually be said for the whole book that it is really pretty masterfully organized and laid out. Everything is crisp and easy to read and find when searching. In the end, I think Knights Black Agents is one of those games that is going to bother me until I get to play it. It just presents such a vibrant and specific kind of story to be told. And it's more likely than not that the heroes prevail. So it's not a downer story waiting to be told. I can't say that I have the strongest imagination in the world, so when a game comes along with a ton of movies and TV shows to support its visuals and its themes, my imagination really comes alive and I'm able to really visualize the kinds of scenes that could play out in the game. This is definitely one of those games, screaming to be played. Thanks for watching, links are below, see ya.